less than a mile from ISIS. Two mortars just hit. Iraqi forces prepare to take back their homeland. If you don't, ISIS is going to be in your house. And it was terrifying. A mom starts bleeding in her brain. Prognosis is grim. And a family starts a network of prayers. The armies of the Lord were encamped around us. On today's 700 Club. Well, there was a debate yesterday, vice presidential from Farmville, Virginia. Used to be Farmville State Teachers College. Now it's Longwood. But they had an interesting debate. And Tim Kaine, one wag said I was reading, he sounded like a high school kid on crack. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. I could not believe it. And uh, Mike Pence showed that he indeed is capable of being president. Uh, Stolly, uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable and, and very appealing. So it was, what did you think? Did you watch it? I totally agree. Kane looked so uncomfortable. He, he, he looked like well, he just was not having fun. Pence was presidential. Yeah. He put everyone at ease. Well, Kane interrupted, I don't know, the, the, I've, I've seen every estimate 35, 70 77 times. 77 times, I think. Yes. Yeah, over 70. 70 yeah. times. I mean, it was the most, and people, you know, the women would think this is the most impolite thing. It was just incredible. He just yak, 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 a little puppy dog. I'm thinking, what is wrong with you? And then uh, he, he said, I, I'm, I'm her right-hand person instead of right-hand man. He's not a man. He's a person. Oh, wow. <laughs> Anyhow, that was a debate. And so um, I don't know whether that will affect the national race, but certainly uh, when it comes to the fact that you, you'll have a uh, Mike Pence potential heir to the throne as a vice president, or you'll have Tim Kaine heir to the throne as a vice president. And, I think people will decide. And well, there's a lot of people on Twitter last night saying they wish they could vote for Mike Pence. Well, he looked good, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I hope that the Donald will pick up some of his points. All mm -hmm. right. Well, Pence defended his running mate, Donald Trump, and Kane forcefully defended Hillary Clinton, interrupting Pence, as we said, more than 70 times last night. White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon has the highlights from Farmville. It started as an even matchup. Two skilled debaters with similar political experience. But it didn't take long for Senator Tim Kaine to demonstrate how he's prepared to be vice interrupter in chief. I was listening to the avalanche of insults coming out of Senator Kaine a minute ago. The, the, these these were said, Donald. He says, he, hold, hold, hold on a second. It's my governor. time, Senator. Uh, it is, he in fact, the right. governor's time. This is your two minutes. Thanks. I, I forgive you. Uh, All right, we are moving on now. Senator, 250, if your son or my people, son handled classified information the way Hillary children, Clinton did, they'd be court martialed. That is absolutely false. And you, know absolutely that. and you know true. that, Governor. Governor, it's absolutely well, true. Because Gentlemen, the FBI please. Did as Kane worked to paint the Trump Pence ticket as out of touch, Pence stayed calm, proving why he's important to the ticket. The pressure to perform was on him after Trump's lackluster week. Then in the final moments of the debate, the candidates were asked about their faith. It's something they both talk about more than their running mates. But when Governor Pence shared his thoughts on the sanctity of life, the gloves came off again. The very idea that a child that is almost born into the world could still have their life taken from them is just anathema to me. And I, and I, cannot, I can't conscience about, about a party that supports that. We support Roe versus Wade. And we don't think that women should be punished, as Donald Trump said they should, for making the decision to have an abortion. Donald Trump and I would never support legislation that punished women who made the heartbreaking choice to end a pregnancy. And why did Donald Trump say that? We just that? never would. Why did he say that? Well, look, look, it's, it's, look, he's not a polished politician like you and Hillary Clinton. And so, you know, well, I would don't admit always that's not come a out exactly thought. the way you... Both men say they take their faith seriously. For me, my faith informs my life. I try and spend a little time on my knees every day. For Kane, a person's faith shouldn't dictate public policy. I try to practice my religion in a very devout way and follow the teachings of my church in my own personal life. But I don't believe in this nation, a First Amendment nation, where we don't raise any religion over the other and we allow people to worship as they please that the doctrines of any one religion should be mandated for everyone. The first rule in vice presidential debates is do no harm. We'll see what the polls say in the coming days. Jennifer Wish on CBN News, reporting from Longwood University. 
And it was wild. 70 interruption. I mean, it was crazy. He was like a little yap, 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 and a little dog outside yapping away. I mean, you know, you just say, shut up. And, you you know, know, Pat, what really struck well, out to me was yeah. that uh, Tim Kaine talked about his religion yeah. and Hillary's Methodist faith. And, and Mike Pence talked about his relationship with Jesus. It That's was right. such a big totally, contrast. Totally. Well, the Catholic Church has already disavowed Cain. I mean, the, the Virginia prelate, the chief Catholic prelate, has said, we don't buy the, the, what he says about these things. So in any event, uh, let's go to our CBN News chief political correspondent, David Brody. David, uh, who won it? Uh, I don't think there's any question, but what do you think? Well, I think it was a knockout for uh, Mike Pence. I don't think there's any question about it. It was a, it was a TKO. Uh, I believe Tim Kaine needed the smelling salts afterwards even, Pat. I mean, it, it was pretty nasty. Uh, you talked about how uh, Tim Kaine was interrupting all the time, and it really, it really didn't bode well for him. I mean, even if, as you look at the Democrats and the liberals even reacting to this, they, they weren't even uh, too happy with the way Kaine approached this. So I don't think there's any question about it. But, but I think more than that, uh, Mike Pence was really able to weave that campaign narrative, that Donald Trump campaign narrative, not just about making America great again, but this uplifting conservative Republican message that, quite frankly, Donald Trump wasn't really able to do much of in that first debate, Pat. Well, uh, you know, what, what do you think um, down the road? Uh, have you been out on the campaign trail? I mean, is, is, uh, are there hidden voters that are going to go for Trump that are not declaring themselves yet? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a closet Trump voter out there. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, Jenna Browder and I were in uh, New York the other day, uh, you know, for the last time for the debate, and we talked to some folks, and uh, they're telling us, shh, we're a closet Trump voter in California, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't want anybody to know about it. So uh, the point is, there's a lot of folks out there. If you notice, Pat, uh, Donald Trump's polling is much higher when it's online polling. Why is that? Well, there's anonymity in online polling. And when you have to actually call someone's house and state your name, it's a much different. So uh, I think there might be a, a tendency for a shock on Election Day. I will say this, that there is a Democrat strategist talking to me privately close to Hillary Clinton's campaign, say they are deathly worried uh, about this silent majority, uh, basically older white uh, male voters who have been disenchanted uh, in the past and may indeed come back for Trump, but aren't saying much right now. You know, that narrative I heard last night from Cain that, that this deal with Iran, which was so terribly flawed in relation to nuclear weapons, the Iranians are going full bore and everything in the world. And, well, Hillary Clinton capped that, and they're not going to come with nuclear. And then he said the Israelis supported it. I mean, I couldn't believe that. Well, there were a lot of false, uh, false, uh, falsehoods last night, and, and that was one of them. I mean, Tim Kaine actually said that uh, Hillary Clinton stopped Iran's nuclear weapon program. And, and, and afterwards, the Brian Fallon, who is one of uh, Hillary Clinton's spokesmen, echoed that as well, said, indeed, Hillary Clinton has stopped the nuclear weapons program. And uh, I remember, I believe it was Megyn Kelly on Fox News saying, well, hold on, he, she didn't uh, stop the program at all. Uh, so anyhow, uh, there, there seems to be a lot of stuff that Tim Kaine was saying in that debate last night. And I know folks will say Mike Pence was saying a few things as well. But Tim Kaine was saying a few things, uh, even on immigration, uh, that seemed to be quite a bit of falsehood to him, where he was talking about how Donald Trump was talking as it relates to immigration, saying that Donald Trump wanted to get rid of all uh, illegal immigrants. Well, actually, what he said, he wanted to get all, rid of all criminal illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of stuff that, that was really not passing the smell test last night. Well, how does it look going in? I mean, we're so close to the general election now. I mean, how, how are you reading the overall? We, we see some of those polls. I don't know who to, who to believe. What do you think? Well, I think we're going to see a tightening. I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Let's start with the vice presidential debate last night. Look, typically vice presidential debates don't move the needle, don't move voters. But in this case, it may be a little bit different. And here's why. Uh, Donald Trump uh, obviously needed some help as it relates to uh, being seen more as that conservative Republican uh, guy. And also on the temperament issue, Mike Pence really did him a good service last night. And, and there are a lot of voters. And I'll just 
just tell you right now, I was taking an Uber this morning, and here's my Uber driver this morning. He looks at me and he says, man, that Mike Pence, I'll tell you what, Donald Trump made a good first decision by picking Mike Pence, and I'll tell you what, I'm thinking about voting for Trump is what he said, because Mike Pence showed that he was calm, cool, and collected. And I think it's interesting. I, I think you'll get a lot of fence-sitting voters out there that will see Mike Pence's performance and go, you know what? I don't know if I'm so much into Trump, but he's got that guy by his side who seems to be calm, cool, and collected. I may get there. Well, David, we'll see what happens. But, uh, man, it's, it's coming down very close to the, to the wire, and we'll be keeping you and Trump. And David has got his finger on the pulse, and we'll be seeing more of him as the days go on. Well, the Atlantic's most powerful storm in a decade is now bearing down on the U.S. Four states are on high alert after Hurricane Matthew blasted its way through Haiti and Cuba. Our Operation Blessing team in Haiti says uh, uh, crops have been completely destroyed in that nation and added this is like a tornado sweeping across the entire breadbasket of the U.S., taking out all the farmers. Well, that's what George Thomas is going to tell us about right now, but what happened to Haiti? This was the scene in Haiti's southwestern tip, where Matthew first made landfall Tuesday, leaving rivers bloated, and many people who live in shacks made of wood or concrete blocks without homes. The entire place is destroyed. Nothing was spared. Nothing. All the trees were destroyed, ripped off. We don't have anything to help us survive. Thousands of people have been displaced as the Category 4 hurricane pounded the nation. With roads blocked and communications down in parts of the country, details are still coming in, but several deaths are already known as rescue workers struggle to reach some of the worst hit areas. Operation Blessing, which has been in Haiti since the 2010 devastating earthquake, has teams prepared to rebuild homes and provide clean drinking water to affected residents. Even before the storm, we started preparing uh, by purchasing uh, building materials to uh, help fix those homes immediately. Uh, we've had a, a, a chlorine a manufacturing machine operating 24-7 since uh, about three, three or four days ago uh, to stock up on, on chlorine. Meanwhile, residents in Hollywood, Florida, we're buying a bunch of canned food, a bunch of water, are getting ready. Your batteries and your lanterns and your flashlights as hurricane and tropical storm warnings are posted along the east coast of the Sunshine State. In North Carolina, Joe Gillis, a fifth-generation cotton farmer, is praying for a miracle. He fears Matthew's strong winds and rain could potentially devastate a season's worth of crop. You know, the good Lord's going to do what he's going to do to us, and we're just going to have to keep the faith and hope that by some stretch of the imagination we'll make it through. In South Carolina, the governor there has ordered more than a million people to evacuate the state's coastline today ahead of Hurricane Matthew. We also anticipate um, averaging about 100 mile an hour winds. So this is something that we want to take very seriously. Haley joined governors of three other states, Florida, Georgia and North Carolina, in declaring states of emergency as forecasters expect Matthew to hit the southeast U.S. coast later this week. If you're able to leave early and go today, do that. Don't take a chance. Forecasters say it will likely take another day or so to get a better picture of the path and potential impact that Hurricane Matthew could have on the U.S. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. Well, here at CBN, we just celebrated uh, the uh, Rosh Hashanah, the, the start of the Jewish New Year. And many people are saying, well, look, why should we as Christians celebrate a Jewish holiday? Well, when we had our celebration on Sunday night, I answered that question at our most recent, all, it was an all-staff chapel and uh, largely attended. Here, take a look at what was said. There were three major feasts. I know they had a whole bunch of them, but three that I want to point out. The first had to do with Passover. And that was the time that they celebrated the leaving of Egypt when they went out into the desert and on to the promised land. And you remember, the Bible tells us that they were instructed on the night before the Passover or of the Passover, that they were to kill a sacrificial lamb and they were to take the blood and put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels of the doors. 
And when the death angel walked through Egypt, he would see the blood, and they said he would pass over you. And it didn't matter whether those people in those houses were righteous or not righteous, whether they had been fighting or not fighting, whether they had been good or bad. What it mattered was, was the blood there or not? And if the blood was there, the angel passed over and they were spared. And then he went and he killed the firstborn of Egypt. And it was a cry that went up from all of Egypt, the Passover. Now that feast was fulfilled in Jesus Christ because the Bible tells us that he is our Passover lamb. He is the lamb of sacrifice. And so that feast was fulfilled when he was crucified. And so you say, okay, mark off one of them. That's been done. That has a New Testament fulfillment. And the fulfillment is in Jesus Christ himself. And that is our hope and our resurrection and our, our hope of eternal life is because of the blood of Jesus. Okay, feast number two was the feast of, of uh, first fruits. And this was the time when they took the first sheaves of grain from the grain harvest and they waved them before the Lord. And they offered to him the first fruits of their harvest. And they said, Lord, we dedicate our harvest to you. This is our first fruit. And this day took place 50 days after the Passover. And that's where they get the term Pentecost, because 20 is 50. 50 days afterwards, the Pentecost. And that was the time when the power of the Holy Spirit came on the church, and the glory of the Lord appeared upon them, and they heard the sound of a mighty, mighty rushing wind, and tongues of fire divided and sat upon the heads of them, and they began to speak in tongues and praise God. That was the offering up of the first fruits of the church unto the Lord. Pentecost was the first fruits. That's been fulfilled. Also, you've got the Passover fulfilled in Jesus. Fifty days later, you've got the first fruits fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and anointed that small company, 120 people in an upper room. Now, what was the third feast? The first, third feast was the feast that took place after the final harvest. It was called the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. And what was told to the children of Israel, uh, when you get into the land, at this particular time of year, you're to go up and cut down branches of uh, conifers and fruit trees and so forth, and come down and build booths for yourselves, and you're to dwell in those booths during this period of uh, booths or shelters, tabernacles. And so they did that, and that was the uh, third feast because at the end of that, they had a feast of tabernacles. But what was tabernacles? Tabernacles was a transition from the old to the new. It was the final ingathering of the harvest before a new year began. I said earlier, the new year, Rosh Hashanah, is the new day of a, a new agricultural year. That's what we're starting. But we haven't yet had a New Testament fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. I've been over in Israel. It was great. I'm in the hotel. You have to go outside on the terrace, and they had all those booths set up and, you know, little shelters over there and everything. It was wonderful. But we haven't had a New Testament fulfillment of it yet. Why not? Because the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is the final harvest, and it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what that is. <laughs> and so that's why we put a big emphasis on this particular time of the year, because we firmly believe that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. 
Some have asked that question. I hope that answered some of the... Isn't that true? The very first time I was in Israel, it was during the feast. Yeah. And it's such a celebration over there. It really is. Um, for, for the Jewish people, but like you said, for us too, because we have that hope. Well, yeah. for them, it, it was an agricultural year. You stopped mm -hmm. one and you started another one. And they, the Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of a new Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Okay. So, uh, 10 days from that, by the way, is Yom Kippur, which is the day of covering, Kafar, covering. And we'll talk more about that. But anyhow, mm. these things have enormous prophetic significance. That's why we're talking about it. Okay, Wendy, right. what's next? Well, still ahead, they're a modern day band of brothers defending their homes from the horrors of ISIS. If you're a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, soldier or not, you come here. Because if you don't, ISIS is going to be in your house. Chris Mitchell reports from the trenches of the war zone when we come back. Well, I just got a report from Chris Mitchell. He came here and he showed me stuff and he's been over there. The battle for Mosul is beginning or getting ready to begin. Mosul is the second largest city in uh, Iraq next to Baghdad. And Mosul was essentially a Christian city. And uh, so the U.S. and coalition forces are planning a major push to take it back. But uh, ISIS has held it for two years. And uh, although they are diminishing, uh, the, I think their number of fighters is net down to about four or 5,000. But as CBN's Chris Mitchell reports from the front lines, Losing Mosul would cost the Islamic, Islamic State in more ways than one. Here's Chris. One of the main forces in the liberation of Mosul will be the Kurdish military known as the Peshmerga. This is a frontline position of the Kurdish military. It's about four to 600 yards away from ISIS positions, close enough to see an ISIS flag on a hilltop nearby. Beyond that is the town of Bashika, a Yazidi village captured by ISIS. Then the plains of Nineveh, and about 18 miles away is the city of Mosul, the prize in the upcoming military campaign. This modern-day band of brothers are Kurdish Peshmerga fighters from Iran. They're one unit of many on a several-hundred-mile front. We joined Dave Eubank from the Free Burma Rangers up on the front. See those buildings right down the, the bottom? Yep. Oh, yeah. You see the road bends to the right? They've come up to the upper bend okay. and assaulted around that corner, which is about 300 yards away. Sitting behind sandbags, we talk with Eubank about the Kurdish military. The Kurds are on the front line. They're on 10-day rotations. That means if you're a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, soldier or not, you come here. Because if you don't, ISIS is going to be in your house. These front lines are lands written about in the Bible. In this particular spot, we're looking at Nineveh, Bashika, then Nineveh, where Jonah was. And people don't change that much throughout history. We all need God. And in Jonah's time, the Ninevites were doing their own terrible things, but they repented. So that's my prayer for ISIS, for myself and for ISIS to repent and follow God's way. Just a short drive away, Commanding Officer General Bahram told us what lies ahead for his troops. Our situation is very good because the Peshmerga are in a good position. And also the Kurdish people are helping us a lot. And the coalition forces are standing with us. He won't be alone. Military leaders from several European nations met with the general. This German commander told us how the Europeans established a center to train the Kurdish Peshmerga and prepare for the Mosul offensive. They need not only training, but a morale boost. Helping with that need is Sister Peshmerga, who comes to the front lines to encourage the troops. She also delivered a message to the world. I want to say, please, we need help. Bring the gun. We need the help. Bring the good uh, things for the Peshmerga, because we we fight in, Peshmerga fight in to all the world. Eubank says the battle is between freedom and tyranny. Down there is oppression, darkness, and death. Here is light, freedom, and movement. We all just came here. Nobody stopped us. We came all the way here. We can go back. You can, you can do whatever you want tonight. You can, you can leave the country if you want. You can stay. You can't do that there. You will dress this way. You will talk this way. You will pray this way. And you will stay until we tell you. Yet life on the front lines means daily harassment by ISIS with mortar attacks. 
Two mortars just hit. One was about 300 yards away. Another was about 500 yards away. This is uh, fired by ISIS uh, at a village just over the ridge here. And uh, this happened yesterday. Uh, a Peshmerga fighter was killed just uh, in a position we were just a little while ago. So this is what happens uh, most every day here in the front lines. It's an attack reminiscent of the trench warfare from World War I. This Kurdish commander showed us the number of mortars shot at his position. Eubank says the U.S. presence makes a difference. Three very positive things U.S. presence does here. One is we help stop ISIS and defeat them. Second, we save lives. The third thing is our presence creates an environment and a possibility and the conditions for people to talk together that normally wouldn't. He also says prayer makes a difference. And my three prayers are ISIS would be stopped, Kurdistan would be free, and the hearts of all enemies would change to follow Jesus. Many of the Christians are praying too, like Milad. He fled his home two years ago when ISIS captured his village, just a few hundred yards away from the Kurdish front lines. Pray for, for us and ask Jesus to help us to go back and pray in our chairs. His prayer could be answered with the success of this key military campaign. The battle for Mosul will include a number of forces, including these Kurdish fighters from Iran. Some reports say that the offensive will take place sometime in October, but it's been postponed before. Whenever it comes, it represents the next major phase in the war against ISIS. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, on the front lines with the Kurdish Peshmerga. Chris has done some tremendous work. But ladies and gentlemen, he's pointed out to me something that I think is very important. Uh, number one, the weathers are very cold, and they're looking at as many as one million refugees in the middle of freezing cold weather. And so if they begin this offensive in October, it'll go into November, December, and it'll be freezing cold, and it'll be a humanitarian disaster. The second thing that he pointed out, something I've known for some time is, the government of Iraq is in the hands of Shias, and Maliki, the former prime minister, and his crew were absolutely corrupt and absolutely partisan, and they, they did not give their uh, Sunni compatriots anything. And so the Sunnis in the army defected and left the uh, Iraqi army uh, decimated. Okay. Now, what we have maintained from the Obama administration is this fiction that the government in Baghdad is the legitimate source of power in Iraq. And so any weapons we send to, Iraq, uh, to help these people goes into Baghdad. Then they take them and use them themselves, and then they dribble a few things out to the Peshmerga. And Chris said the Peshmerga forces are woefully underarmed. They, they're, uh, their armaments are antique. They're not up to, to uh, modern standards. And if we just would give the stuff directly to the Peshmerga, directly to the Mosul fighters, they could defeat ISIS in a heartbeat. But instead, we're siphoning the money down to Baghdad where it's being dissipated. But anyhow, that's the way it goes. But these are brave people, and they are fighting for their homes, but they're fighting for us. Mm -hmm. And if Wendy was there, she and I would be up on the front <laughs> lines. We would be there. I would want to <laughs> do it, to smell the corday, listen to I the think bombs. I would be keeping my head a little lower than Chris did, though. But well, he's brave. Well, I mean, Chris that said was... that there are snipers, and they told him you've yeah. got to be careful because the sniper can be looking through a telescope a couple miles away and, and hit you. And so, you know, he, he's got to be careful. But you know, you think it's the front lines in more way than one. Absolutely. It's but they, you know, mm. but we've had a screw up. We've mm. got to arm those Peshmerga. We've Amen. got to do something to help the Kurds. Okay, Pray next. Pray for them. All right, well, up next, a wife and mother with bleeding on the brain. If she survives, she may never be the same. She may have complications of, in essence, stroke-like symptoms. She's, these are people who are oftentimes in persistent vegetative state. See how this woman receives a miracle. Plus, we're going to be praying for you and your needs when we come back. Well, we are in the home stretch of our 40 day campaign to pray for America. Just 10 days left. And if you've been following the news between the elections and the hurricanes and everything else, 
you know that our country desperately needs our prayers. If you haven't signed up yet, please do so now. It's not too late. Just go to PrayForAmerica.com and show your support. You'll be joining more than 100,000 of your fellow believers from all 50 states. And uh, you can also call us. The number is toll free and easy to remember, 800-700-7000. Tell the person on the other line that you want to pray for America. And on behalf of a grateful nation, we say thank you very much. So we're all praying, Pat. Well, when Tina <laughs> Hare was struck with a brain aneurysm, doctors held little hope for her survival. But her husband, Randy, says, no, no, I'm holding on. I've got a word from God. But Tina would live and not die. Watch this. In early June of 2013, Tina Hare was having a tough day. I remember being very stressed out, just had a horrible headache, and I just wanted to get in the bath and relax, just have a few moments of peace in the bathtub that day. That's the last thing Tina remembers. Moments later, her son John heard a strange sound coming from the bathroom. She was trying to say, help, help, but sound like, who, who? John ran to get his father, Randy. I went in the bathroom and saw her laying in the tub on her stomach, making this horrible noise, and it was terrifying. Randy offered a desperate prayer and then called 911. First thing I said is, Jesus, please help me. And I asked for him. to protect my wife. Tina was rushed to the hospital where doctors discovered an artery in her neck had burst, leaking blood into her brain. When a patient comes in with a ruptured carotid uh, aneurysm, prognosis is grim. If they come in unconscious or in a coma, um, then they are likely to die. They'll have a 40% risk of death in that first 24 hours. Doctors believe she wouldn't live long enough for surgery and told Randy to gather family members to say goodbye. It's your worst nightmare because my mother had died from a brain injury, so I know what that can do. But I stopped and checked my spirit to see what the Lord was saying. And the first thing he said is, she will live and not die. Friends and family filled the ICU waiting room and prayed throughout the night. When the prayers were coming on, it felt like the armies of the Lord were encamped around us. Tina survived the night, but the artery continued to bleed, putting more pressure on the brain and leaving her paralyzed from the neck down. She was lifelighted to the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, where doctors performed surgery and stopped the bleeding. Following uh, Tina's surgery, she was still at significant risk of mortality of death. Um, up to 25% of patients with the level of injury she had will die over the following six months. Doctors warned that even if Tina did live, she might never be the same. She may have complications of, uh, in essence, stroke-like symptoms. She may have difficulty moving parts of her brain, difficulty with speech, difficulty with memory, personality changes. These are people who are oftentimes in persistent vegetative state. The only thing to do now was wait and pray. I had to ignore what my eyes saw and uh, focus on only what my heart saw. Friends and so forth were constantly coming back and coming back and we ended up uh, finding out that all these people all over were praying for us. Whole churches all over the Southwest. There was a convent full of nuns up in upstate New York who were praying for us. Seven days after surgery, doctors brought Tina out of the coma. She was fully aware and speaking clearly. Her first words were basically, where are my babies? <laughs> and <laughs> what's going on with them? Tina was still paralyzed over 90% of her body and they continued to pray. Then a week later, the feeling in Tina's arms and legs began to return, and she was able to stand with help. The next day, she took her first steps on her own. It was a major hallelujah moment. Jesus is totally faithful, and he never fails. He doesn't know how to. She continued rehab, and then just seven weeks after her aneurysm, Tina returned home to her children. I just cried and cried to thank the Lord for giving me this moment, for letting me have this, and let me have a second chance at life. Tina's doctor couldn't agree more. I was truly amazed at her recovery. Uh, this just should not have happened. I believe that God played a role in this, and her, her, her recovery truly was a miraculous recovery. God had his hand on this.
It's been three years since Tina was found unconscious in the bathtub. Today, she shows no signs of brain injury. She is completely healed, and she and Randy are eternally grateful. God loves me, and the fact that he would do this for me, that he would bring me back and let me have my life, my beautiful life. It's like the most wonderful miracle ever. For I don't know how long after that, after she got out of the hospital, whenever we'd be somewhere with our children doing something, I'd hug her and say, this moment's brought to you by the Lord Jesus Christ, without whom it would not be possible. Man, a miracle, a miracle of God. What a wonderful report. Here's something, by the way, add to that, if you can do such a thing. Pauline lived in Stanford, Connecticut, been suffering with migraine headaches for four years. She's a faithful viewer of this program. And every time we would pray, she'd get on her knees and pray with us. And one day as she prayed, she heard Wendy say, quote, I see a lady. You're in front of your TV on your knees. You have been suffering with migraines for years. God's healing you. Mm. Pauline said, that's me immediately, and she has been free from migraine since. It was a dramatic miracle. I remember that day. Oh, do you, going, do you, you remember? I yeah. do. All right, Lawrence of uh, Deland, Florida, had been experiencing hearing loss and pressure in his inner ear for a couple of years. He saw a specialist who cleaned the ear cavity, but it didn't help. One day, Lawrence was watching the 700 Club when he heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, saying somebody's got an abscess in your ear. Your ear will pop and it'll drain. Lawrence thought, I don't think this will work, but he raised his hands anyway to claim the healing. His right ear popped open, then about 15 minutes later, his left ear started draining and he's had no issues ever since. Whew. How See, about that? You didn't know Pauline and I didn't know <laughs> Lawrence, but God knew them. Folks, we're gonna pray right now. There's nothing impossible with God. Nothing impossible with God. Thank Amen. you. We're gonna join hands right now. Father. I join with my sister in Christ, Praise and we believe for your miracle power. Amen. Your kidney is shut down. I don't know, something about right, but anyhow, the, the kidney has shut down, and God has just opened up. That kidney is going to start functioning. Uh, it, it'll be like dialysis taking place even as we speak. Wendy? There's a lady in you. Your leg is just hurting so bad. Is something going on with your veins? Uh, they're protruding. They're very painful. God is touching your leg right now. Receive it in Jesus' name. Your neck, there's a bulge there. It's like a muscle is bulged out, and you just, it's very painful. Touch it right now in the name of Jesus, and it's healed. Go there, ahead. There's a man, and um, you. you're struggling to relearn to speak after a stroke, and it's just, really uh, more emotional uh, pain right now that you're in. And God is just telling you just to be patient with yourself, and He's going to heal you, completely restore your speaking in Jesus' name. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. We cast out a spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus. We speak the word in your life. That spirit of fear will go in Jesus' name. Touch. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wherever you are, tell us what God's done for you. We thank God for you. 1-800-700-7000. It's easy to remember. 700-7000. All right? All right. Well, coming up, guess what? We're going to bring it on with Pat. Here's Douglas's question. He asks, how can I be sure I'm going to heaven? We're going to tackle that question and much more, so stay tuned. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News break. Former President Bill Clinton is calling Obamacare, quote, the craziest thing in the world. You've got this crazy system where all of a sudden 25 million more people have health care, and then the people are out there busting it sometimes 60 hours a week, wind up with their premiums doubled and their coverage cut in half. It's the craziest thing in the world. Hillary Clinton's press secretary called her husband's statement shorthanded and said he has supported Obamacare since 2010. On the other hand, Donald Trump thanked President Clinton for his critique of Obamacare, saying, quote, at least he's honest. Franklin Graham says one issue outweighs all the rest in this election, the future of the U.S. Supreme Court. 
He emphasized that the next president's choice for a new Supreme Court justice will impact the country for decades to come. Graham called for a Christian revolution in the nation while visiting Michigan on his 50-state Decision America tour. He also said abortion and same-sex marriage are sins against God and, quote, just because it's the law of the land doesn't mean it's right. Graham wraps up his Decision America tour next Tuesday in North Carolina. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Welcome back. Well, nearly 5 million Syrians have fled their homes because of civil war. Many of them are children now living in refugee camps. That's where we met a young girl named Rahaf and discovered that she desperately needed surgery her family couldn't afford. Daily life for Syrian refugees in Lebanon is rough enough, but it's especially difficult for Rahaf, who struggles just to see. Sometimes she would trip and fall just trying to walk. Kids in the camp teased Rahaf and I tried to comfort her, but I knew she was suffering and there was nothing I could do. Rahaf's mother told me how their family was forced to run from their home in Syria because of the civil war, dodging bombs and sniper bullets. They came to Lebanon hoping to start a new life, but the Lebanese government won't let Syrian refugees get jobs. We're not allowed to work, but we still have to pay rent to keep our tent in this camp. We're in so much debt and we can't even afford food, much less the surgery needed to fix Rahaf's eyes. When Heart for Lebanon, which is supported by CBN, found out about Rahaf's problems, we got her the corrective eye surgery she needed. Now Rahaf is able to study at the Hope Center, a Christian school for Syrian refugee children. Here, with the support of CBN, kids are learning math, Arabic, and English. I'm really happy now because I can see to read and write. I can even play outside with my friends without falling down. Rahaf has become a different person since the operation. You have given her a future. She smiles a lot now, and that brings joy to our whole family. The children at the center also get to watch Superbook in Arabic and learn about Jesus Christ. I love Jesus because he forgave us of our sins. He has been with me and protected me during the war and all the bad times. We also give food to Rahaf's family and thousands of others in the refugee camps every month. You are the only ones that have truly cared for us and the other refugees. The kids are so happy when you come and we always talk about how amazing the food is while we prepare it. We sit down to a meal and we say, God, please bless these people as they are blessing us. I want to thank Heart for Lebanon and CBN from all my heart. Can you imagine having to flee your country because of war, having to live in a tent, not knowing where your next meal is coming from? That's what's happening to these people. But CBN is there. And when you join the 700 Club, you're there too. You are helping these people that right now, they are completely dependent on, on Christians. A lot of times it's the Christians that are showing up that are helping the Muslims. So we need to do that. We need to be there for all of these people that God, that Jesus died for them. And we want to be there for them to help them. And when you join the 700 Club, we have a special gift for you right now. It's called the Gospel of John. It's read by our very own Pat Robertson. This is a great thing to put in your car and you can listen to it on your way to work, on your way to the gym, uh, wherever, and just uh, really enjoy hearing the Word of God uh, when it's convenient for you. Well, Amen. before we get into our Bring It On, I yeah. really enjoyed coming out to meet your new horse last week. Oh, did you? Habanero? He? Habanero. Habanero. Hot sauce. See, he's a beauty. He is a beauty. There and there you are. Yeah. I took a picture. That's oh, your, bless your heart. Um, you did indeed. And that's your, your trainer. Uh, what's yeah. Your, well, she's a, she takes care of the she horse. She takes care of the, the, the horse, right? Barn helper. But she's, yeah, that, that's a beautiful horse. He's, he's uh, trained in the Prix St. George, which is one level below Grand Prix. And he knows more about the stuff than I do, but he really, you get some good pictures. I love this picture of 
because you you both look like you're laughing. You both look like you're having a good time right there. You're habanero. It's like looks like well, he's smiling. You, right? yeah. He's but, an Andalusian. He's a beautiful thing. Uh, he's Spanish, and so I tell the girls we're going to do Spanish missionary work, and so we go out and there. And he let is. me just tell you, I mean, Pat doesn't just like gallop around. Uh, he does all these very special things that I have no idea what you call them, but. Well, it's it's uh, dressage, and uh, he does off and he does passage and he does pirouette and he does uh, you know flying changes and he does hand gallop he does all this stuff so it's fun it's to have really, a good well trained horse it's very impressive I can tell you that well I'm glad you <laughs> please come back you're always welcome thank you good pictures okay <laughs> well we are going to bring it on right now we're going to start with Douglas and he writes in I really want to be confident that when I die I'll be in heaven I can't think of anything more important. How can I know for sure that I'm saved? Should I feel differently than I did before? I'm confused. What do you think? Well, um, you've got to believe the Word of God. You know, John 5, 24, you know, he that hears my word and believes on him that sends me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible is filled with those promises, and you need to stop playing with it and just say, look, I believe it. I'll take it. I, now, I tell you what, now I, I don't want to say that's true, but you may have some sin in your life. You may not have confessed you know, who you are and what you've done. Get right with God. If you're still playing around with something, if you're doing something that is sinful, you will not have a confidence in your heart. If the Bible says, if my heart condemns me, then God's greater than my heart. Mm -hmm. But if I, it does not condemn me, then I have confidence before God. So ask yourself, what am I doing? And, and I'll give you the word. The Bible says it. You can believe it. But in your own life, don't hold back. All right? All right, Debbie says, do I need to tithe on my inheritance? Well, I think so. I mean, the inheritance is, hey, you've got a million dollars extra coming to you, so you give $100,000 to the Lord, and you've got 900000 It's all yours. It's tax-free, and you can enjoy it. I think I, I would say yes. All right. I definitely would. I mean, because it's not yeah. something you pay taxes on. Sure. All yeah. right. Ben says, I've been a Christian my whole entire life. There have been days when I've asked God why things have happened to me. I never even seem to get an answer. Why does he seem silent? I want to do what God wants me to do, but I need his direction. Uh, listen, God will move heaven and earth to keep you from being misled. So what you do is surrender to him. You say, Lord, I surrender to you. I, I, I'm yours totally. I'll do whatever you say. Please lead me. And believe me, God will move heaven and earth to keep you from being misled. He will answer that prayer. All right? And Valerie says, my husband and I have been married for four years, and he drinks alcohol about five to six days a week. When he has too much, he becomes verbally abusive and says very degrading things to me. Then we'll go two to three days and not even speak. I also caught him viewing pornography, but, but now that he knows I know, he erases his browsing history. I've prayed over this matter during the past four years and have been counseling with him, and I've gone alone as well. The stress is affecting my health. I think it might be best for us to separate, but I need some godly counsel. Please help. All right, here it is. Uh, I, I don't think God intends you to live in a situation like that. I think your husband's playing with it. I don't know if he knows the Lord or not, but I think the time has come for an ultimatum to say, look, I'm not going to stand for this pornography. I'm not going to stand for your drunken tirades. I'm not going to be the subject of your abuse. I'm not going to do it. And uh, we go to counseling or else I'm going to ask for a degree of separation. That doesn't necessarily mean you divorce him, but it does mean that uh, uh, you are separated from this. You, you shouldn't have to live under that kind of torment. God calls us to peace. He doesn't call us to constant warfare. And, uh, but I, I think you, you lay it on the line. This guy is playing games, and uh, he's using you as a foil. He, he perhaps shouldn't be married. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but uh, I, I know he, he apparently doesn't know the Lord. So. 
lay out something for him, okay? Well, that's good advice. All right. Four years is a long time to be praying and living with that oh, situation. You, you don't do it. You just say, look, yeah. I, I'm out of here. And, you know, and, and I, I'm going to ask for a degree of separ a decree of separation. You can get that short of the divorce. Right. Okay? Well, great uh, answers. Wonderful to be with you. Hey, listen, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this kid's going over to that Mount Everest <laughs> over in Nepal. Nepal, Kathmandu. Kathmandu of all places. I love that name. And we want to pray for her. You know, she, she's a good kid. She won't want her to be back. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I will come well, back. All right. Our power minute <laughs> comes from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. Tomorrow, we'll sit down with Inside Edition's uh, Megan Alexander. You won't want to miss that. So we'll see you tomorrow. And for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Goodbye. God bless you.